it is in all the scriptures, in the Hindu Upanishads, everywhere it is said, and also in Christianity. It is the mind which is the greatest obstacle on spiritual path. The constant automatic thinking of the mind, constantly churning uh, memories and, and desires and mm -hmm. um, thoughts of the future and so on and so forth. And this mind has to be stilled somehow in order that spiritual experiences can come through. So what is done? The mind is thrown into confusion. It is rather, I could compare it, you know, the law of nature is everywhere. It's as above, so below, on, spiritual plane, and on, on the spiritual plane and also in this life. It is like a pendulum going backward mm -hmm. and forward. It's one of the law of nature. It's going this way and then going back. So it is kept artificially between the desperation mm -hmm. and the nearness. It's as, as if the further away, the more desperate you got, then the more desire you develop to finally break through. Correct. Absolutely put it just right. Mm -hmm. And what happens, not only the teacher does it, but your state of mind is like that. It is as if the great beloved or oh God does the same thing to you. You can pray and then you can't and you are desperate. Mm -hmm. And actually the idea is when the mind is completely desperate, uh, at, one, at one moment it sort of stops in the middle, utterly helpless. And it is in this moment so-called illumination can come. Moments of great clarity. Moments of great clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can call it illumination yeah. in a Christian sense, or great clarity. Mm -hmm. You put it very beautifully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, your teacher um, referred to two different paths or, or two different methods of, of, of attaining enlightenment, one through meditation and another one which I guess has to do with the title of the fire in your book, the idea of burning away the dross of, of the spirit or the yes. soul. And yes. that was the, the more direct, the intense path, which, which is the one that you were. Yes. You the were one on. is called in Sanskrit the path of Tyaga, which is the shortcut, so to say. And the other one is the path of Dhyana, what we, pr what we practice in London. This is rather slower path, but mm -hmm. it's not so painful. Yeah. In the path of Tiaga, you have to give up everything, all the worldly possessions, which I had to do, and you have to give yourself away in utter surrender. But here is an interesting point. He did emphasize again and again, you have to surrender to the Guru. One doesn't surrender to the Guru, not really, apparently to the Guru, but it's not. One surrenders to the light within oneself the light of the soul, that part in us which belongs to eternity. Now you, you mentioned that when you looked at your guru, that when you were contemplating suicide, you saw this radiance yes. from him. <clears throat> and you refer often in your book to the fact that many times he, he would just have you come to his house and, and you would sit and he would be asleep but he, he would be working on, on the inner planes, doing yes. things, affecting your soul in ways that you couldn't even know. This is correct. Mm -hmm. And most things on the path of the mystics are not known to the mind. They are, we go through, or you can go through, anyone can do it, can go through if you are on the mystical path, the most wonderful experiences. The mind knows very little about it. And he said one day to us, what you can understand with the mind is not a high state. The less you understand, the better. Mm -hmm. Now that for us Europeans, who especially for those people who are living at academical circles, is absolute nonsense. The, bet the more you understand, the better it is. Yeah. It is not so on the spiritual path. Well, there does seem to be a paradox here because for, for people who are trying to find a spiritual teacher, and uh, you re refer yourself to the many false gurus there are, there, one needs to use this little tool we have, whatever intellect or, or, or ways of discerning or discriminating, to find a good one. Well, I don't know what to say to that, you know. Do you mean to recognize which one is a good one and which one is a bad one? Well, at least initially, isn't that important? It is terribly important, but there is no guiding line. 
I don't know how, you know, I feel that even a bad guru can teach you something. Mm -hmm. Everything can teach one in life. Everything. Life is the greatest guru itself, and it's the greatest miracle. So I really don't know how to answer to that. I recognize my teacher, but I think this is a question of destiny or karma, like they say in, in, in Sanskrit. If it is your destiny to recognize your teacher, and it is a real teacher, then you will. If it is your destiny to fall into the hands of a Zyudo guru, as you just mentioned, well, that's it. Uh -huh. But the intention is that one should learn in one's life whatever, what can, whatever one can learn. That is actually the desire of the soul coming into incarnation to learn a certain lesson. Uh -huh. The personality doesn't know what lesson one intends to learn. What one is intended for it to learn, I must, must correct uh -huh. myself. Uh, well, I think I am an incorrigible optimist. Uh -huh. I, I believe that everything is for the good. Mm -hmm.